We find ourselves in the third Sunday of Advent and in this unfolding event with wonderful ancient words. We started our journey two weeks ago with Zechariah and Elizabeth. They are confronting their barrenness. They could not conceive a child. And then the angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah and says, I'm going to change all that. And Zechariah says, how can I be sure of this? And then everything is laid out before them both. And eventually, as Elizabeth becomes pregnant, she says these profound words. The Lord has done this for me. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among people. Last Sunday we gathered together and we learned about Mary. Mary, the favored one. The same angel Gabriel comes to her, this young teenage girl, and says, You will give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus. The angel then tells Mary, Nothing is impossible for God. And then when everything is laid before Mary, she says, let it be according to your word. And this morning, we read about Elizabeth and Mary coming together, discerning their life, changing events. And Elizabeth turns to Mary at their initial greeting and says, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And then Mary shares those wonderful ancient words. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Friends, welcome to the heart, the pulse of the good news. A real life illustration of what occurs when God brings a blessing to us that goes beyond just saying, thanks God, taking it and moving on. Because I think this chapter, this first chapter of Luke, especially when we see Elizabeth and Mary together, helps us clearly define what we mean by the good news. The good news. Because the good news is only, is ever only good news when certain things happen. As they happen to Mary and Elizabeth. Because ultimately, first and foremost, good news is only good news if it is shared. And we do this all the time, don't we? Something good happens, you get on your phone, you get on the phone, you share it with people. Birth of a child, a promotion, a diagnosis that went better than you thought. All kinds of things can bring good news, and the first thing we want to do is to share it with others. But let me ask, what about the greatest good news? <clears throat> Why does that seem so hard to share? If it's the best of good news. Because good news must, first and foremost, be shared. Because it was important to Mary. Now please understand that in this text, Mary doesn't confront the angel Gabriel. Angel lays it all out. She opens her front door and goes down the street to visit Elizabeth. Please understand that this journey that we are talking about from Nazareth to Judea was 70 miles. Does that put a little different spin on the story for you? 70 miles. Mary must have thought this good news needed to be shared. Now, there's nowhere in this particular text that said she had anyone alongside her. So nothing about Joseph? So let's just say for argument's sake, here's Mary, pregnant teenage girl, walking 70 miles alone, fearful, difficult trek, so that 
that she might share her own good news and learn of Elizabeth's also. And isn't it amazing that you and I are here today. I don't care if someone strapped you to the top of the car like a Christmas tree to get you here. But every one of us is here today because someone, somehow, at some time, shared the good news with you. It may have been a parent, a grandparent, a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker, a Sunday school teacher, or a pastor. Someone shared the good news of Jesus Christ with you. And just think about this. A generation from now, when most of us will be long gone, those sitting in this sanctuary will be in this sanctuary because we took the time to share the good news with them. A bunch of kids right now went through those double doors, went to the climb the stairs, and right now 30, 40 kids are learning the good news of Jesus Christ by about a dozen adults. Because the good news is only the good news if we share it. But as we share it, the good news must also be celebrated. This good news ought to bring us joy. I want to talk just for a moment about what I'm calling the dichotomy of emotion on Sundays. Let me repeat this. The dichotomy of emotion on Sundays. Now, this diagnosis usually happens in a male species. Where many times we can come to worship tired. <laughs> tired. And droning voices. Oh my God, when is this going to end? Is it done yet? I love it when he says, and in conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> but then something miraculous, it's a miracle, something happens to those spirits, and it happens about one o'clock on Sunday afternoon, <laughs> about one o'clock until about 11 p.m. Something happens in the male species, usually it can happen in the female species, also, but something clicks, something where that droning, tired spirit at 1 o'clock p.m. can suddenly jump for joy, can put a big old smile on their face, they can yell and they can scream and literally burst into tears with a winning field goal. <laughs> but what about the good news? Elizabeth had it. I enjoyed the video, but the video did one thing wrong, and that's why I almost didn't show the video. Scripture is very clear that what she said, she said in a loud voice. And she exclaimed in a loud voice the blessedness of Mary. John was excited. He left in the womb. Mary was excited and filled with joy because we are told that she breaks out perhaps into a song. The good news must bring joy. The good news must be shared. But the good news must also, my friends, be lived. Please follow me on this one. This Magnificat, Mary's song, sings of God's kingdom and revolution. Christmas is a revolution, my friends. The silent night that we all yearn for ushers in a radical transformation, liberation, and deliverance that we often, too often, dismiss. The good news is God's divine plan of justice and mercy where the mighty are defeated and the lowly are rescued, 
where the hungry are fed and the rich are turned away hungry. Merry Christmas. Christmas is a revolution, my friends. The good news is lived when we stand on Christmas Eve with our candles in hand, singing Silent Night, and then we blow them out and the lights go on and we sing Joy to the World. It's not joy to the Methodists, joy to the Protestants or the Catholics. It's not joy to America. It is joy to the world, which transcends gender, race, greed, geography, and becomes the true living embodiment of true liberty and justice for all. But here's my story. Here's my struggle with Mary's words, and maybe they're yours. When we all sit in our comfortable homes, which are a blessing, to share a gluttony of food and gifts, which is a blessing, with those we love, which is a blessing, on the day of Christ's birth, to thank God for our bounty, which is a blessing, do we also in that moment see the lowly, the lonely, the forgotten, the forsaken, and the hungry? Christmas is a revolution, my dear friends. And I believe the good news becomes the authentic good news only when we share, celebrate, and live to fulfill the pronouncement of the angel to the shepherds, proclaiming good news of great joy for all people. And when we see Christmas, when we embrace the good news to share, to celebrate, and to live, I think then and only then can we join Mary in saying, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Let us pray. Wonderful God, we thank you. We thank you for this time of Advent, this time of preparation. For not just the Christmas of the silent night, but the Christmas that turns our world upside down. The time that we see firsthand your kingdom and not our often made up kingdom. So Lord, may this passion, may this revolution, may this birth of the Christ child be real to us this year. And may it always be surrounded in the hope, the peace, the joy, and the love that comes from you and you alone. In your holy name we pray. Amen.